The Bizarre Murder of Judy Smith. And this is from Crime Wire. Judy Judith Lois Eldridge was born December the 15th, 1946, in Hyannis, Massachusetts. She was described as a kind and helpful person. She put herself through college and eventually became a home health care nurse. By 1986, Judy was twice divorced with two adult children from her second marriage. She worked as a caregiver for a patient recovering from throat surgery. This was how she met Jeffrey Smith. He was the son of the patient. Jeffrey was immediately struck by how kind Judy was and how well she took care of his father. Jeffrey, a lawyer who was also divorced, soon began to date Judy. Their previous failed marriages made both of them hesitant about the idea of remarrying, so they took things slowly. It was seven years before they would move in together and another three before they got married in the fall of 1996. By most accounts, the couple was happy and they enjoyed attending basketball games and going to the theater. Jeffrey Smith was a legal rep for the Northeast Pharmaceutical Conference, an organization of executives and researchers based in New England. It was in this capacity that Jeffrey was asked to attend a conference in Philadelphia that would take place from April the 9th through April the 11th, 1997. Judy decided to come along on what would be the first trip the couple had ever taken together. After the conference, they intended to meet with friends in New Jersey before returning home. On April the 9th, Judy and Jeffrey arrived at Boston's Logan International Airport in, um, for their 1.30 p.m. flight to Philadelphia. She realized too late that she had left her driver's license at home. Because of the new FAA regulations requiring passengers to pro provide ID, Judy was not able to get on the plane. She told Jeffrey to go ahead without her, explaining that she would go home and get her driver's license and just take a later flight. He agreed and boarded the plane. Judy ended up taking the 7.30 p.m. flight to Philadelphia that evening and bought flowers to give Jeffrey as an apology. Jeffrey said that he was just glad that she was there and wasn't bothered at all that she needed to take a later flight. The next morning, the couple spoke before Jeffrey headed out to his conference. Judy said that she wanted to spend the day sightseeing around Philadelphia and visiting some of the tourist attractions, like the Liberty Bell and Independence Hall. Planning to attend a cocktail party together that evening, they agreed to meet back at the hotel at around 5.30 p.m. When Jeffrey arrived at the time agreed on, he found that his wife was not in the room he assumed that they had merely had a miscommunication about when to meet and that she had probably already left for the party. But when he went downstairs to check, he couldn't find her there either. He went back and forth between the hotel room and the party multiple times that night hoping to run into her, but she never showed up. Most of Judy's belongings were still in the room. The items missing included her wallet, her wedding band, and her signature red backpack that she often carried instead of a purse. Jeffrey said he believed she had roughly around $200 on her. His next course of action was to pay a cab driver to take him along the same route the Philly tour buses used, as Judy had planned to board one that day. He hoped to see his wife somewhere along the way, but unfortunately, he found no results. Jeffrey was still cl no closer to finding out what happened to Judy. As the midnight hour approached with no signs of his wife, Jeffrey finally tried to file a missing person report. However, the police were dismissive and told him that he needed to wait at least 24 hours before he could do that. 
So they don't seem to mind that this woman is in a city that she may have not traveled to before, that she had left um, her hotel room to go on a tour of their city and hadn't returned. Um, they didn't seem to be concerned that maybe she had gotten lost and was wandering around trying to find a way back to the hotel or maybe she'd been attacked by somebody. Did they check the local hospitals and that type of thing? Jeffrey then appealed to the Philadelphia Mayor Ed Rendell and Pennsylvania House Rep John Purcell, both of whom were in attendance at the conference, to convince the police to take action. Sympathetic to his situation, they got the wheels in motion and began an investigation into Judy's disappearance. Jeffrey was relieved to find that the the authorities were now taking this serious. Well, they wouldn't have had he not had these connections with these people because he worked for a major pharmaceutical company and, um, you know, the police already suspected that Jeffrey was involved in Judy's disappearance and they weren't convic convinced that she had ever even made it to Philadelphia. However, they soon confirmed that she was indeed listed on the manifest for the 7.30 p.m. flight that she boarded. So they, they had it in their head that this guy had killed his wife or did something to his wife back at their home and that he's making up this whole story about her having arrived. And keep in mind, this was 1997, but... You know there were still cameras, and the and the airplay, the uh, airports still kept records and stuff like that. Also, there were other people who remembered seeing Judy in Philadelphia. A hotel employee told police that Judy asked him where she could go to to get on the bus tour. Additionally, a bus driver claimed that he did pick her up and let her off. Um, the bus at the hotel at around 3 p.m. Eyewitness accounts that came in the days that followed ranged from unremarkable to bizarre. She was reportedly seen leaving a Greyhound bus terminal on the day she vanished, but her family believed that she most likely only stopped there to use the restroom. Other accounts tell of a woman matching Judy's description who appeared to be disoriented and delusional. She reportedly spoke in tongues and made strange comments. A local homeless man was also convinced that Judy had slipped next to him on a bench. Well, the woman reportedly had such a striking resemblance to Judy that even Craig, her son, and his sister traveled to the city to look for her, mistook the homeless woman for their mother when they first spotted her across the street. Someone else came forward to say that they had seen and spoken to Judy while working as a cashier at a mile in New Jersey, which is only 22 miles from Philadelphia. The cashier recalled that the woman said she was shopping for clothing for her daughter and joked that her daughter rarely liked the clothes that she picked out, a detail that her daughter Amy later confirmed. The woman had a red backpack and went on to say that her husband was at a conference in Philadelphia. So what I would say is this is probably the last known sighting of her. This is when Judy's case went cold. At one point in the investigation, police considered the possibility that Judy had gone through a midlife crisis and decided to leave her husband to start a new life. Jeffrey found this insulting and explained that such behavior would be wildly out of character. I think the fact that they dated and, and lived together and were in a relationship for 10 years prior to getting married would have given her plenty of opportunities to say if she didn't want to be with him, she would have not gone into 
a marriage with him. Um, I think sometimes when the police get to a point that they just don't know what else to say, they fall back on that and say, um, yeah, she just left, or he just left. They just ran off with some new person, or they just decided to go off and start a whole new life. People, that rarely ever happens in reality. People, for one thing, can't afford to just step and leave their lives. Who wants to work their entire life away working toward a retirement and a pension and then just say, okay, I'm just going to shirk it all and go off somewhere and live in the woods? It's it's not real it's not realistic. And the police need to stop falling on that tired, old, outdated mentality that this is what people do. Unless you are extremely independently wealthy, it's very hard to just disappear purposely. Jeffrey didn't give up on trying to find his wife. As soon as he returned home, he hired a team of private investigators and began distributing flowers. Those close to him said that Judy's disappearance took a toll on him. He even cut back on his workload as a defense lawyer, explaining that now I feel that I'm a victim. I couldn't continue to represent criminal defendants. Amy, her daughter, said that as far as she was aware, her mother's marriage was going well. She spoke very nicely of Jeffrey, calling him an honest man. In fact, most of Judy's family and friends were of the opinion that things were good between her and Jeffrey. However, the outlier in this group was Judy's friend, Carlin Dickey, who had this to say on the subject. Judy and Jeffrey's marriage was very tenuous. I believe something did happen that triggered her to want to have some time away from him. Well, you know what, friend? If she didn't want to go to Philadelphia with him to this conference, that would have given her three or four days to herself at home away from him. Why get on an airplane? Why... Leave your driver's license at home, return home to fetch it, go back to the airport, get on the plane, fly to Philadelphia, check into the hotel with your husband. If you wanted time away from him, you would have simply said, you go on ahead to the conference, I'm going to stay at home, take some time to myself to relax, and in that time, she could have packed her belongings and moved out. She would not have left behind her children. Even if she wanted to leave Jeffrey, she would not have walked away and left behind her children and the rest of her family with any, without any answers. I, I just don't buy that. Judy is found. There were no further developments in the case until September the 7th of 1997 when a shocking discovery was made 600 miles away in North Carolina. While hunting deer in the Mount Pisgah National Forest, a father and son found human skeletal remains near the Stony Fork picnic area. Some of the bones had been scattered by wild, wild animals, while the rest were wrapped up in a blue blanket and buried in a shallow grave. What items found on or near the body included $167 in cash and a blue and black backpack, a wedding ring, and a pair of sunglasses. Cuts on cut. Cuts on both the clothes and bones indicated the unidentified had been stabbed to death. A forensic examination determined that the victim was a Caucasian woman between the ages of 40 and 55 who had a severely arthritic knee. She had been killed several months earlier. 
The murdered woman didn't remain unidentified for long. A doctor in Franklin, North Carolina, read an article about the discovery and was re immediately reminded of Judy Smith. He had learned about Judy months earlier from one of the flowers that Jeffrey had distributed. He contacted authorities and suggested that they look into this. Judy, who was known to have a severely arthritic knee, was positively identified using dental records. The wedding ring found was, with the remains was confirmed to be hers. At the time of her murder, Judy was wearing a different outfit. This one was suitable for hiking than the one she was last seen wearing by her husband. Also, her red backpack was nowhere to be found, and her family didn't recognize the sunglasses that they had found with her body. Despite these unexplained elements, they never doubted that this was truly Judy. But how did Judy end up over 600 miles away from Philadelphia, and who killed her and why? Several aspects of the case continue to defy explanation. Though Jeffrey was evidently never officially cleared by the police, they did come to the conclusion that it was unlikely that he committed the crime because he was suffering from health problems. It would have been like it would have been difficult, if not impossible, for him to have committed this on his own, especially without leaving behind any evidence. A much likelier explanation is that Judy was murdered by someone else, either a stranger with homicidal intent with whom she had the misfortune of crossing paths, or perhaps someone that she knew and had gone to North Carolina to meet. Some have theorized that Gary Michael Hilton, also known as the National Forest Serial Killer, may have been responsible. Judy's body was discovered close to where Hilton had left one of his other victims tied to a tree less than a year before. He has never been positively tied to Judy's case. Other eyewitnesses in Asheville, North Carolina, which is very close to where this took place, where her body was found, claim to have seen Judy in the days following her disappearance. She seemed very alert to me. She was pleasant. I didn't see anything about her that would indicate that she was in any kind of distress. She told me that her husband was an attorney and that they were from Boston. She said she had been in Pennsylvania and that she decided to just come down to North Carolina. Well, I mean, it's possible that just on a whim, she said, you know what, I'm just going to get on a plane or I'm going to rent a car or I'm going to jump on a Greyhound bus and head to North Carolina. Maybe she was wanting to get away from her husband, but like the people said, she wouldn't have just walked away from her kids. Um, another interesting sighting was reported by a deli owner. According to this woman, Judy came to her store in a gray sedan and purchased $30 worth of sandwiches and a toy truck. So who was the toy truck for? And who was she buying sandwiches for? Investigators consider these to be credible sightings. Where did the gray sedan come from? Um, Judy's case is still open and unsolved. Sadly, Jeffrey Smith passed away in 2005, never having learned the identity of his wife's murderer or how she ended up over 600 miles away. In 2016, York County District Attorney reopened Judy's case. In addition to re-interviewing witnesses, investigators conducted an audit on all the case files and reports. 
Physical evidence has been examined and forensic testing options are being considered. The investigation was described as progressing. Chief Deputy Prosecutor David Sunday, who made the call to reopen Judy's case, said, I'm confident our detectives are making progress. I'm confident they are obtaining new leads, and I'm confident where they will go. Um, I think it would have been very simple for her to just said to her family, I'm not happy. I don't want to be in this marriage anymore. I'm going to go take myself a little vacation and think things through. And don't worry about me. I'll be okay. It just The whole thing just doesn't make any sense at all. If she left Philadelphia on her own, if they said she was seen, they believed that she was seen at a Greyhound bus. So did she buy a bus ticket? Was there any trace of that? Did she pay cash? Her husband said she had roughly $200 and her body was found with $167. It's possible she had more cash than he knew about. Did the bus company keep records of who bought tickets? Did you have to give your identification in order to purchase a ticket? Um, the only other way I can think of that she could have gotten from Philadelphia to North Carolina without being on an airplane would have been to drive or have someone to drive her to drive her there. Was it possible she was she had met someone online and arranged this? Were her records checked? Were they able to do that at that time? I, I assume. Um, Other than that, had she met someone maybe through her husband's company that was also going to be in Philadelphia for this um, event that they went to? And maybe the two of them had been having some kind of ongoing secret relationship and arranged this whole thing at the time? Bones had been scattered around an area about 300 feet in diameter by animals. At the center was a shallow grave where the majority of the skeleton remained, still partially clothed. The state medical examiner determined that the bones of the then unidentified person were those of a white female between the ages of 40 and 55. She had extensive dental work and suffered from severe arthritis in her knee. There were cutting marks on her ribs, and among the clothing recovered from the scene was a bra which had cuts and punctures. The investigation concluded that she had been fatally stabbed, and her death was classified as homicide. An emergency room doctor in North Carolina saw an article about the discovery in the newspaper, and he connected the dots to flyers that Jeffrey had sent out. A detective asked Jeffrey for his wife's dental records, and they were sent to the medical examiner who was positively, who was able to positively identify her. The evidence with her bones suggested she had been with someone else. More significantly, her leg bones were still clad in jeans, thermal underwear, and hiking boots. These were not the clothes. She was wearing when she left the hotel when Jeffrey last saw her. So they're, they're saying here that they believe that she was deceased in mid-April. Her body was not discovered until September. So they're pretty much saying that she died very soon after she disappeared. Um, the presence of the money and her wedding ring have led investigators to conclude that robbery was not the motivation. However, the red backpack she was carrying when she left the hotel was not found with her and has, as far as I know, has never been found. The clothing she was wearing when she left Philadelphia was not with her. She had a pair of expensive sunglasses and no one in her family remembered ever seeing her wear them before. Judy's family could not imagine why she would have gone to Asheville. According to them, she never expressed any desire to go there and had only been to the area twice. 
Once she visited Jeffrey for a week when he was there at a weight loss clinic in Raleigh, Durham. On another occasion, she had accompanied a patient on a drive south as he visited family. That's, that's a question there. Had she become close to some of this patient's family and kept in contact with them in that area, in the Tennessee, North Carolina area? And had she arranged to go down to visit them? Had she started a relationship with one of this man's, one of this patient's family members the way she had started a relationship with her husband when he was also a family member of one of her patients? So that was the question. Did they talk to that family and find out if any of them had been in contact with her or if any of them was involved in this? An employee at the Biltmore Estate recalls seeing Judy. Now, the Biltmore Estate, most of you probably know, it's a big, huge estate in Asheville. You have to pay to go inside to visit it. You can see it from the highway, but in order to go inside and tour, you have to pay. And so, had she done that? I don't know if they kept logs of people that came to visit or not. But an employee said they recall seeing her. At a campground near where her body was found, the owner recalls that she drove up in a gray sedan with boxes and bags. She asked if she could spend the night there in her car and drove away when they told her she could not. A deli owner in the same area told the Philadelphia City Paper that Judy came into the store in a gray sedan and bought $30 worth of sandwiches and a toy truck. So who was she buying this toy truck for? Was she, like I said, was she coming there to visit people that she knew in the area? And maybe they had a child? Um, investigators with the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office have ruled out Jeffrey Smith, who died in 2005. He was morbidly obese, and they believe that he would not have been physically able to have taken his wife's body to the slope where it was found. And I don't think he would have been hiking in these mountains. Um, it was also um, confirmed that he was in Philadelphia, that he was never out of anybody's sight long enough to have made a trip to North Carolina dispose of his wife's body and then drive back. So, he was eliminated. Well, it says here the Philadelphia police never eliminated him as a suspect, but the North Carolina police did. They said they just didn't think. Um, the detective in North Carolina who investigated the case says he believes that Judy was not abducted and that she came to Asheville voluntarily. They believe that she was killed elsewhere and dumped at the site. I don't know about that. I don't know about that because even a healthy, strong person who's used to the outdoors would have just as much difficulty carrying a body up this slope into this national forest and disposing of it without being seen by anybody and without exertion, you know. So I don't, I don't, I don't believe she, maybe the lack of blood, but we're talking about five months from the time she disappeared till she was discovered. So my belief is that she was out there with somebody hiking and they took her out there and murdered her, disposed of her body. It was not for profit. It was not for a, a robbery. Not unless she had more money on her or something worth money that nobody knew about. Because they left behind the cash in her wedding ring. Um, I think the wheels in my head are saying she had gotten involved with a married man. She made this trip on a whim to North Carolina to be with this man, and he had to get rid of her. That's just my thoughts, you know?
I don't know if they were able to determine because of the decomposition of her body, if they were able to determine if, and they said that her, her legs were still clad in blue jeans. She was not nude, so I don't think that she was a victim of rape. And she just either came into contact with the wrong person or she was there with someone she knew and they murdered her. So I don't know. That's just my thoughts on it. The, the only theories, like I said, the police had was that they do not believe that it was the husband due to his obesity and his health problems and the fact that they couldn't place him out of sight long enough for, this, for him to have done this. And some people believe that she didn't go to Philadelphia, that he killed her at home, arranged to have her disposed of while he was away for an alibi, but sightings of her at the hotel, she was on the manifest for the airplane for the, uh, at the airport. Um, people at the hotel said they saw her there. So... She may have mentioned to her friend that, she, you know, her and her husband were having problems. A lot of women and men do that with their friends. They vent and they tell, you know, I'm angry with my spouse or we're having problems. Doesn't necessarily mean that you get in your car and drive, you know, 600 miles away and then you're found five months later murdered, never having contacted anybody. It just doesn't add up. So, I don't know. I, I guess the only thing I can do to wrap this up is just say this is a big mystery. Maybe one day it will be solved. I don't know if they were able to get any kind of DNA off of the remains. They said she was stabbed to death. I don't know if they were able to determine if there were any blood you know, any DNA from touch DNA or anything like that on her clothing that isn't even mentioned in this article. Here's a quick little story from Apple Podcasts. On April the 9th, 1997, Judy Smith, a 50-year-old wife and mother, decided to accompany her husband, Jeffrey, on a business trip to Philadelphia. The following day, Judy set out to do some sightseeing while her husband attended a conference. When he returned to their hotel room that evening, Judy was not there, and she could not be found anywhere in the city. Five months later, Judy's remains were discovered in a mountainous area 600 miles away in a North Carolina forest. The evidence indicated foul play, but eyewitness sightings seemed to suggest that Judy had traveled to the area voluntarily. Why did Judy take this 600 mile impromptu trip without telling anyone in her family? How did she end up dead in the Appalachian Mountains? And this is a podcast called The Trail Went Cold on Apple Podcasts if anyone's interested in listening to that. That's really all I can provide on this case. Um... The, the husband is deceased. I don't know if the children are still pursuing, if they're still in contact with the sheriff's office in North Carolina. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a strange case. Thanks for watching.